Last year, dispatches revealed a message of hatred and intolerance in some of Britain's most mainstream mosques. We Muslims have been ordered to do brainwashing. An ideology with its roots in Saudi Arabia. The pinnacle, the crest, the summit of Islam is jihad. But the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia said it was not responsible. And Britain's most important mosque promised vigilance against extremism. So we've gone back undercover to see what message they're promoting now. The one who changed his uh, deal, what we're going to do? Okay. Okay. The last day will not come until the Muslims fight the Jews and kill them. Our reporter, a Muslim herself, is going undercover in the most important and influential mosque in the country. London's Central Mosque, an Islamic cultural centre, usually known as Regent's Park Mosque, says it promotes tolerance and interfaith. We featured it in last year's dispatches, and the mosque promised to crack down on anyone promoting extremism on its premises. So she's going back to find out if they've been true to their word. Women aren't allowed in the main hall, so she's directed upstairs to the main women's section on a large balcony overlooking the hall. Hundreds of women and children come here to pray every day. Then the congregation gathers in a large circle. The teacher today is Um Amira. She says she's teaching from a book by Sheikh Fazan, a senior member of the official Saudi religious establishment. This is very, very good. She starts with a revision session on what should happen to people who break Islamic laws, including Muslims who convert to another faith. But he's Muslim and he gets out of Islam. He doesn't want any more. What are we going to do? It's the same for adulterers. For the head, had the zina, what is the law of this? Until he died. And the one who is not married, he yeah, never dies. Now, with 100 lashes. The worshippers, many of whom are children or teenagers, are being taught the Saudi Arabian interpretation of Sharia law from official Saudi books. The teachings include the brutal killings of homosexuals and women who act like men. If someone makes them seem like a, a man, a woman like a man, they understand this, the punishment is killed. Kill them from the highest uh, place. And not going to be like animals, living like animals. Or to be like the people of Lord, or Allah. We have to take the head, the head is to kill them. This causes a brief debate among the young students. One girl says they should also be stoned. Another student says the punishment is approved by the Quran. Then we reduced him to the lowest of the low. So if you throw someone up a mountain, you are reducing him to the lowest of the low because they're falling off from a high thing. In fact, punishments like throwing homosexuals from a mountain are nowhere mentioned in the Quran. It's a hardline interpretation taught in Saudi Arabia. Um Amira condemns terrorism and says these punishments will only be carried out in a future Islamic state under a Muslim leader, not in present-day Britain. This fundamentalist interpretation of Islam is being taught in Britain's most important and supposedly moderate mosque. Our reporter finds out where Umar Mira has been trained. She says she's just finished three years of study at Medina Mosque in Saudi Arabia. It's the second most holy mosque in Islam, and its imams teach Muslims an interpretation of the faith known to some as Wahhabism. Umar Mira teaches what she says is an important principle in Islam. A Muslim must hate as well as love. It's not enough that you worship Allah, you have to also uh, 
uh, in our heart uh, uh, hates what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is pleased to Allah and love what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala she says this principle relates to living with non-Muslims. Hate what is peace to Allah, especially when living with this country with that non-Muslim. And asks a worshipper to read out a verse from the Quran. Stand up and Stand up. Which she says is about relations between Muslims and non-Muslims. We are free from you and whatever you worship besides Allah, we have rejected you and there has appeared between us and you hostility and hatred forever until you believe in Allah alone. Uma Mira says it means Muslims must separate from non-Muslims. You understand, sister? Islam is the development of shirk. The shirk and the ahli, the people who do the shirk. Any questions? After the lesson, our reporter approaches Uma Mira to ask her to clarify her teaching. You know when we talked about the, the love and enmity for Allah, how, how do we apply that? How is a Muslim do I apply that? Yeah. Muslims should show good manners to non-Muslims and can try to convert them to Islam, but cannot befriend them. She uses the Arabic term kafir, meaning disbeliever or infidel. To be good, good friend, uh, give them all about our secret. You know, you understand? You have to be friend with them. That is not allowed. Because the wala is only to Muslim, not to the kafir. Uma Mira says she's learned this doctrine of separatism in Saudi Arabia, whose clerics preach a brand of Islam often called Wahhabism. Wahhabism is opposed to the diverse and tolerant traditions of classical Islam, according to moderate British Muslims like Sheikh Musa Admani, an imam who's advised the government on Islam. The Saudi Wahhabi worldview is very narrow. It's extremely intolerant. This extreme intolerance comes out of seeing non-Muslims as basically non-human. Intolerance, hatred, dislike, this is not Islamic teaching at all. Separating from disbelievers is the official theology of the Saudi state, according to Saudi academic Professor Madawi al-Rashid. The Saudi religious uh, scholars um, adopt a very strict and radical um, interpretation of the status of a, a Muslim minority in a non-Muslim society. A true Muslim should not associate with infidels. So you are physically here, but mentally, socially, religiously, you belong elsewhere. Now we found this message of segregation being taught at the most important mosque in the country. It's visited by world leaders and even has its own interfaith department, which organizes visits from government, the civil service, representatives of other religions, and thousands of British schoolchildren a year. The mosque says the aim of these visits is to promote understanding and respect between the communities. Our reporter is filming as some of the interfaith groups are brought into the women's area. So this is what we have in our heart. It's just On this occasion, Umamira meets them. God, let me know how to reach you the way, the right way. On another occasion, a group of non-Muslims is invited to sit down with the circle. The preacher promotes Islam to them, but talks politely about other religions too. And, uh, and the message, the Quran, came to confirm the truth in the previous scriptures. But as soon as the interfaith group leaves, the same preacher's tone changes completely. She now says Christian teachings are vile. And we feel nothing sometimes going past the church. We don't look at it in disgust and think, SubhanAllah, what are these people doing in there? What they say with their tongues is so vile and disgusting. It's an abomination. Like the other preachers in the circle, she says she's teaching from the works of the Saudi scholars. In this case, Sheikh bin Baz, a former Grand Mufti of the kingdom. The teachings include that a Muslim cannot be tolerant of other religions. He shouldn't just be indifferent and say things like, you go to church, you know, I go to the mosque, let's all stay together like one big happy family and all be united as humanity. This is false, this does not work, this concept is a lie, it's fake and it's a farce. The circle preaches for eight hours a day on Saturdays and Sundays. Any woman who goes there to pray is likely to hear their preaching. Our reporter is told the circle was set up years ago by Umamira, but while she's been in Saudi Arabia, 
It's been run by this woman, Um Salim. She too preaches Saudi teachings. She says she's met a Muslim woman who is too friendly to non-Muslims. When she sees a Kafir woman, big smile. When she turns around, she sees me there. <laughs> yeah. It's part of Islam, of the aqid, of the correct belief that you, you love those who love Allah and that you hate those who hate Allah. Okay. Although the preachers say Muslims should act well with non-Muslims, in private they were often disparaging about their ways and beliefs. In two months at the mosque, we only recorded one incident of dissent. A worshipper sitting in the audience objects to the teachings on disbelievers, saying Islam encourages Muslims to mix with others. I mean, there is an ayah from Quran that says, you know, we made a few peoples, different shu'ub, to know one another. And if you communicate with the other and you show the beauty of Islam, then, you know, then maybe could, people could come into Islam. The preacher qualifies her statements a little. It doesn't mean that we should oppress them. It doesn't mean that we don't give the right, it doesn't mean that we don't, don't help them. Okay? But then returns to the main theme. But it doesn't mean as well that we should befriend them. Regent's Park Mosque was set up 60 years ago to represent British Muslims to the government. It says its role is to help Muslims integrate into British society. The Women's Circle does preach against terrorism, and doesn't incite Muslims to break British laws. But far from preaching integration, Um Salim says Muslims cannot take British citizenship. Their loyalty is to Allah. There are some conditions that can take you into the kufr to take the British citizenship. Whether you like it or not, for these people, you are selling your religion for... It's a very serious thing. It is not allowed, allowed to give allegiance to other than Allah. And another preacher says Muslims shouldn't live in Britain at all. Is that, is that befitting for Muslims that he should reside in the land of Abel, the land of the, 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 the land of the disbelief? A Muslim should emigrate to a Muslim country. On Fridays, the women can hear the mosque sermons from the main hall. These sermons are given to a thousand or so worshippers by the mosque's official imams who by historical agreement have been supplied by the Egyptian government and are trained in Egypt. These sermons our reporter heard were very different from the women's circles teaching, stressing a tolerant and diverse Islam. But our reporter has found that upstairs, British women are being constantly exposed to hardline Saudi teachings. There are other links between Britain's central mosque and Saudi Arabia. It's been heavily funded by the kingdom and the mosque's director general is from Saudi Arabia. Dr. Ahmed Al Dubayan is the public face of the mosque and in overall control. I would like really to express our prayers, our condolences and so After the 7th July bombings, he held a press conference there to condemn terrorism. And it is not accepted by the Muslim community. It's not accepted also by all means by the Islam itself as a faith and as a religion. Dr. Al Dubayan is not an imam. He's a Saudi diplomat. He's Islamic Affairs attaché to the Saudi Embassy in London and has full diplomatic immunity. Dr. Al Dubayan told us that some of the preachers, including Umm Amira, were unknown to him. He said Umm Salim had requested permission to be an authorized teacher at the mosque, but had been refused, as she did not supply references and written information about her teachings and views. He and the mosque had not known of her teachings and views, which did not reflect those of Regent's Park Mosque. He said, The ICC is committed to interfaith and cross-cultural understanding. It does not support or condone extreme views, racial hatred, violence or intolerance. Um Salim told us, We are not blind followers of any government or any clerics. We do criticize other religions just as other religions criticize Islam. However, this does not mean that we show intolerance, aggression or violence to people of different faiths. And we have often emphasized that the Muslim's attitude towards his or her non-Muslim counterpart is one of fairness, compassion and tolerance. We encourage integration into society. She said the comments that Muslims could not take British citizenship were erroneous and apologized for them. She said, 
Whilst it is recommended for a Muslim to migrate to a Muslim country, it is not obligatory. In last year's dispatches, we found the mosque's official bookshop was selling a number of speeches by preachers promoting hatred and intolerance. The worst word that can ever be written! Dr. Al Dubayan told us the bookshop was independently run by a company called Darul Salam International Publications, a British company with links to Saudi Arabia. But he said he was seriously concerned and said that the DVDs had been removed immediately, pending an investigation. And he called on all British Muslim organizations to be vigilant about the message being spread on their premises, either during talks or on recorded DVDs. So our reporter went back to the bookshop and went to the same shelves to see if he had been as good as his word. But despite his promises, she found they're still selling the speeches of exactly the same preachers we identified last year. They're still selling DVDs of Mutaza Khan, a British school teacher and preacher. In this one, he attacks the Western idea that women can be independent from men. The mental capacity of this society teaches you, I'm a woman in my own right. I can get my own job, I can get my own funding, I can get my own welfare, I can get my own flat, I can get my own home, I can get my own state benefit. I don't need you in my life. What is that? Deception of the devil. And says men should control them. A man is stronger than women, but men today don't know how to take care of their families. That's why their women walk loose, their women speak loose. And that's their evil society, that Muslim society has become like that today. And they're still selling DVDs of Sheikh Faiz, who was trained to preach in a Saudi religious university, condemning disbelievers. Uh, the kafar, the kafar. Who cares what they do? They do the most evil, filthy things. The disbelievers, the evil, wicked, mischievous people. Balak, you can see the evil in that face. Do not mix with people who do not prostrate to the oneness of Allah Ta'ala, who do not prostrate to the Almighty Lord. Keep far away from people like that. Last year we found DVDs of him calling Jews pigs who would be killed at the end of the world. In this new one from the bookshop, he is still condemning Jewish beliefs and Jews themselves. The leader of pride or arrogance are no other than the Jews. Wallahi, they've got the most extreme racial pride in them <laughs> an abominated filthy disgusting gross belief their time will come like every other evil person's time will come and they're selling more speeches by sheikh khalid yassin who learned arabic in saudi arabia in some of the dvds we found he says muslims could have a constructive relationship with non-muslims but in this DVD, he praises the Sharia law practiced in Saudi Arabia, saying he's witnessed public beheadings there. When you enter Saudi Arabia, everybody knows how everything goes. They're the only ones that have the, have the, 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 that have the power and who have the audacity and who have the principle to continue punishing the people as Allah SWT say punish them. At least I say we Muslims should have that kind of power all over the world and that people can see people without hands. People can see in the public, heads rolling down the street. People got their hands and feet from opposite sides, chopped off, and they see them crucified. They see people get punished. They see people get put up against a pole and see them get lashed in the public. They see it, and because they see that, that acts as a deterrent for them because they think about that. They say, oh, I don't want that to happen to me. Sheikh Yassin told us his comments should be considered in context. He said he did not support or promote Saudi Arabian government policy or religious rhetoric and said capital punishments are carried out by many states and governments. He said, That lecture was aimed at reforming the Muslim people, the Muslim society and the Muslim world, to be adjudicated by the sovereign Islamic state when one exists. Dar es Salaam International Publications told us the bookshop sells a wide range of material which they do not necessarily agree with. They said, We try to represent a variety of opinions through the products we sell. 
in order to spread peace, respect, tolerance and understanding. We were unable to contact Mataza Khan. However, last year he told dispatches. My discourses have never been delivered with the intent to malign any individual group or race. They are delivered to inspire Muslims to better themselves and then to play a positive role for their own and wider community in Britain. Dr. Al Dubayan reiterated that the bookshop was run by an independent company. He said, Despite having no control over the bookshop, we met with those running the bookshop after your program was broadcast. We made it clear that it was not acceptable for the bookshop to stock materials containing extremist views, as we consider these materials to be offensive and contrary to the aims of the ICC. We were assured all offending material had been removed and systems put in place to prevent this reoccurring. Dr. Gaya Sudin Siddiqui founded the Muslim Parliament in Britain and is director of the Muslim Institute, Britain's oldest Islamic think tank. He says the mosque's bookshop has previously been caught selling radical books as well as DVDs. Whenever such books are found, I mean, the only explanation from the administration has been that it is not part of us. But, uh, I mean, uh, you have no compulsion to having that bookshop, so close it down. Uh, uh, but this story goes on and on. They continue to sell books which are promoting basically Saudi Wahhabi ideology. As long as the Islamic Culture Center in Regents Park remains in the hands of uh, Saudis, there will never be a unity among Muslims in Britain. Next, we investigate claims that the Saudi Arabian state is involved in spreading a message of intolerance and segregation. The dispatch's reporter is filming undercover inside Regent's Park Mosque. It's the most important mosque in the country, and one which claims to be dedicated to promoting moderation and integration. But she found its official bookshop selling speeches attacking non-Muslims. It's believers that evil, wicked, mischievous people. And preachers teaching British Muslims to separate from non-Muslims and their society and to believe in Islamic states with extreme Sharia law. The one who changed his uh, deal what we're going to do is keep. keep. Now our reporter was to witness Saudi religious rulings being given to women in Britain. After a month with the women's circle, she finds they're using the mosque to select some of the worshippers and invite them to private sessions. She's asked along. She heads for the meeting. It's taking place in a private house in North London. In the mosque, the circle gives general religious instructions to a few hundred women. But here, they're told by a senior member of the circle that they can get individual religious rulings from the Regent's Park Mosque preacher, Umm Salim, which will directly affect their own lives. So Umm Salim, who is our teacher at the masjid, okay. she basically is coming to give a halakha about, you know, various topics, anything you want to ask, anything you want to know. Umm Salim answers their questions with strict rulings on women's personal freedom. She says they can't travel far without a mahram a male member of the family to escort them. Whoever believes in Allah should not travel without Allah. This alarms one woman in the audience. My sister, like me and my husband, we, we can't go together. So what do I do if I want to go? Yeah. She's told she can't travel by herself. So what do I do? You go with your husband. <laughs> the British government says empowering Muslim women is a key part of its strategy against extremism. This year, Gordon Brown launched an advisory group of Muslim women to encourage integration into British society and greater participation in the workplace. The important thing for our country going forward is that every single citizen feels that they have a part to play. The aim is to help tackle radicalism, according to Saudi academic Dr. May Yamani. The current British government's uh, uh, policy is about empowering women to be part of the community where they live and participate and get jobs. This policy is certainly very important
to keep real moderation in the community. Regions Park Mosque says it aims to help Muslims integrate into society. But in the private sessions, Umm Salim criticizes Muslim women who do so. We are going to see Muslims in every sphere of the everyday life in this uh, country. I, I see Muslims, it breaks my heart when I see them working in banks, short sleeves, sometimes this tight, the scarf like this, makeup, you know, being with the kufa all the time, even speaking with the language. And he, she learns that this woman has a job in the health service. No, no, is the, is the job work, okay, the job that you are doing? Does it involve anything haram or is it? No, no. I work in pathology, hematology, just blood tests. Just blood tests? Yes. And they don't allow you to wear jilbab? Um Salim finds out that the woman can't wear a jilbab, a full Saudi-style Islamic covering, while at work. And she's working alongside men, which is forbidden by Saudi scholars. Do you work only with females? No. Um Salim says this is not acceptable. Uh, you know that uh, working in an environment that is not Islamic, working with the kuffar, all this takes you away from the deen and, and hardens your heart. And it will be lying to you if I say it's okay. We asked Dr. Yamani what she thought of this kind of Saudi teaching being spread to British Muslims. My reaction to this, restricting women a job in a hospital, performing their job and working with patients at a hospital because of type of gown they're wearing, or restricting the, restricting the movement of a woman in the street, in London, or anywhere in Britain, my reaction is, this is not Islamic. They're not even justified by the basic Islamic texts. Um Salim denied to us the meetings were clandestine. She said the rulings that women could not travel alone and could not work if it conflicted with religious requirements were totally justified by Islamic texts. She said, You may regard these juristic and textual rulings as extreme restrictions, but we see them as our way of life and a liberation of the soul. Saudi teachings on women's freedom are also being spread in Regent's Park Mosque's official bookshop. They're selling the religious rulings known as fatwas of the top official Saudi scholars, such as Sheikh bin Baz, the former Grand Mufti. The rulings say women are mentally inferior. Men are superior to women in general. And restrict their right to work or travel on their own. When women go to work in the workplace of men, it is in clear opposition to the text of the Sharia that order the women to remain in their houses and fulfill the type of work upon which Allah has fashioned her nature. And it tells fathers they can marry their daughters off before they reach puberty without their permission. Last year, dispatches showed how Saudi religious rulings like these were being spread throughout major mosques in Britain. The Saudi Arabian government told us it was not involved in spreading a fundamentalist message and said, There is no such thing as a Saudi Arabian religious establishment. So we asked the experts. There are people in Saudi Arabia, especially at the level of government, who deny that there is such a thing as a Saudi religious establishment. But this is an absolute myth. There is a religious establishment. It's a bureaucracy that is in control of a lot of institutions in Saudi Arabia. The Wahhabi religious establishment are constantly indulged as the co-rulers of the Saudi government. They control some of the most important levers of power. The Ministry of Islamic Affairs, the Ministry of Pilgrimage, the control over the judiciary, the control of most of the educational system. The religious establishment is headed by the country's most important clerics. The Council of uh, Higher Ulama uh, or Religious Scholars is a body that is established by the state uh, whose main function is to issue religious opinion but it is uh, also responsible for overlooking the functioning of all other institutions. 
And the Saudi government has a bargain with the religious establishment. It allows them to control the social sphere, morality, or the public space. In return for that, they get uh, subsidies, they get uh, their salaries, but also it gains their acquiescence. So the religious establishment in Saudi Arabia is an integral part of the system. Whether the ruling elite admit that or not. The Saudi government has spent billions of pounds spreading Islam around the world. During the reign of the late King Fahad, only from the 70s to the mid 80s, King Fahad has spent 75 billion dollars funding schools, madrasas, mosques, charities throughout the world. Official Saudi websites give the figures. The result is some 210 Islamic centers wholly or partly financed by Saudi Arabia. More than 1,500 mosques and 202 colleges and almost 2,000 schools in non-Islamic countries. Saudi funding has a huge effect on British Muslim life, according to some Muslim commentators. Uh, Saudi Arabia has uh, immense influence in Britain through their support of mosques and imams. Uh, when the Muslim community came to this country, they were not organized and they did not have enough resources. So they went to uh, Saudi Arabia to collect funds. And through that thing, they were able to influence, propagate their ideology all over this country. Many preachers in Britain have been trained in Islam in Saudi Arabia, like Umar Mira, whom our reporter filmed preaching at Regent's Park Mosque. She spent three years studying at Medina Mosque. This is the official website of the Saudi Ministry of Islamic Affairs. It prints the sermons of Saudi imams and gives an idea of some of their teachings on non-Muslims. Fellow Muslims, following the kafir is disgraceful, while disobeying them is mighty. When a kafir dies, the whole of humanity is relieved. Beware of taking them as friends. You should hate them, disown them and their religion. This Saudi Imam is overcome with emotion while reading a Quranic verse cursing Jews and Christians. Saudi books with the same message of segregation continue to be wildly available in Britain, such as these official fatwas sold in Regent's Park Mosque bookshop. The enemies of Allah are the disbelievers. It is necessary to avoid mixing with non-Muslims, to like them, to love them, to support them, or live amongst them. We found Saudi Arabian religious teachings being spread at Britain's central mosque, which is run by a Saudi diplomat. This is another Islamic institution in Britain, funded by Saudi Arabia. The King Fahd Academy in West London is an independent day school for 500 Muslim children, run under the support and supervision of the Saudi Embassy. Dr. Al Dubayan, the head of Regent's Park Mosque, sits on the board of trustees. In 1998, the school started teaching some of the pupils the same official education curriculum that's taught to children in Saudi Arabia. Colin Cook is a Muslim convert and worked at the school as an English teacher. Eighteen months ago, he was dismissed after raising concerns that some of the children were cheating in exams. But this year, he won £70,000 for wrongful dismissal at an industrial tribunal. After he left, a contact still there passed him official Saudi textbooks from the school. The books carry the stamp of the Saudi Ministry of Education. The books teach that other religions are worthless. One quotes a Quranic verse. Those whom God has cursed, he turned into monkeys and pigs. And in a footnote says, It is said that the monkeys are the Jews, the pigs are the infidels of the table of Jesus, the Christians. And another passage sets the children a test. I read that the books were asking the children to describe the repugnant characteristics of the Jews 
and I found that repulsive and appalling. I believe these textbooks will poison the minds of anyone that reads them. The King Fahd Academy said it agreed that the passages were inappropriate, but said that they had never been taught at the school. The books had now been disposed of, and the Saudi curriculum had been phased out altogether. It said the passages on Jews and Christians related to an Old Testament event. It does not imply or infer that this is a general comment on these faith groups today. It said Ofsted had found that its pupils showed good empathy and tolerance of others' views. Every year, the Saudi ambassador to Britain, Prince Mohammed bin Nawaf, holds a conference with the British Foreign Secretary. He says the aim of the dialogue is to promote tolerance and mutual respect. That the theme of this session is forcing, focusing on how each community perceives the other and how to promote positive views and mutual respect. Our young people need to discover in learning about one another. But the British government's policy on tackling radicalism and the message being spread by Saudi theology are incompatible, according to security expert Professor Anthony Cleese. What the British government wants is uh, for British Muslims to feel part of a, an inclusive British society. Now what the Saudi version of Islam is saying is that Islam is not just a religious identity, it is also a political identity. And that they should resist, that it is right to resist, being assimilated into mainstream British society. If you believe in Wahhabism or if you are a supporter of Wahhabism, then basically uh, there is no integration, meeting of two sides. There is no respect for the other side. As a consequence, we have seen Muslims becoming isolated and marginalized. By the government's own thinking, separateness makes it easier for British Muslims not to regard Britain as their homeland, but as the enemy. Next, our reporter goes undercover in a third major UK Islamic institution to get first-hand evidence of the kind of Saudi material being spread in UK mosques. A dispatcher's reporter is filming undercover, investigating major Islamic institutions in Britain with strong links to Saudi Arabia. She found preachers in Britain's most important mosque promoting extreme Sharia law. Someone make them seem like a, a man, a woman like a man. They understand this, the punishment is kill. Kill them. And selling DVDs with a hardline message. People can see in the public, you know, some people got their head, hands, their hands and feet from opposite sides, chopped off, and they see them crucified. And we showed a British school run under the supervision of the Saudi embassy, which imported books condemning other religions. I believe these textbooks will poison the minds of anyone that reads them. Now our investigation turned to a third major Islamic institution in Britain. This is the UK headquarters of the Muslim World League and the World Assembly of Muslim Youth. They're worldwide charities and run a five-storey complex of offices, a mosque and prayer rooms in the heart of London's West End. Although their headquarters are in Saudi Arabia, they say they are independent of the Saudi government. They say they give out Islamic literature promoting coexistence and moderation between cultures. So our reporter is going undercover to find out. They run weekend Quran courses and she gets a place. The lessons are run by this Imam. The charity say they give out Islamic literature. So after the lesson, our reporter asks for some. She says friends of hers are setting up a mosque and Islamic school. He says they do give out books on Islam. He says they mostly give out English translations of the Quran. 
زیادہ زیادہ یہ جو ترجمے کا قرآن ہے نا ان کے پاس یہ ہوتا ہے She asks where the books are coming from. He says they come from the headquarters of the two charities in Saudi Arabia and a third source. Ministry of Islamic Affairs. The main sources in three sources. The charities based here claim to be independent of the Saudi government. But the Saudi Ministry of Islamic Affairs is using them to send books to Britain. And this official Ministry of Islamic Affairs website says the Muslim World League operates under its supervision. The two charities were set up specifically to spread the Saudi version of Islam worldwide, according to many moderate Muslim observers. They are massive organizations. They are global organizations backed by so many Saudi clerics and enormous funding. They will organize conferences, fund centers and mosques, uh, provide literature, free literature for distribution. And of course, it's all funded, organized by these two groups. Our reporter gets an appointment with the director of the London offices of the Muslim World League. She tells him friends of hers are setting up a mosque and school. And he agrees she can take some books which are kept in a locked basement. <laughs> With another undercover reporter who is posing as a friend, she goes along to pick them up. The imam unlocks the basement. The room is full of books. Our reporters are given a number of books. Nearly all of them are from Saudi Arabia. Some condemn terrorism, others are straightforward guides to Islam and don't promote extremism. But others preach the same teachings our reporter had found being spread at Regent's Park Mosque. Including works by the former Grand Mufti Sheikh bin Baz, advocating violent Sharia law punishments, such as death for Muslims who believe homosexuality is permissible. It is permitted to shed his blood and take his belongings. The books say, Love, support, loyalty and friendship with disbelievers is forbidden. Muslims must do jihad until all countries are ruled by Islam. If some of the people of the non-Islamic countries stand against Islam, they must be fought. And they must act upon the reported words of the Prophet. The last day will not come until the Muslims fight the Jews and kill them. Our reporter was given a sample copy of the translated Qurans they distribute in Britain. It's brand new, published in the last two years, and is produced under the supervision of the Saudi Ministry of Islamic Affairs. It bears King Abdullah's own seal of approval. We showed the new translation to Sheikh Musa Admani, who studied Islam at India's top religious universities. Whoever believes in Allah in the last day. A number of verses in the Quran preach peace and tolerance between Muslims, Jews, and Christians. But the Saudi Quran contains footnotes saying these verses are no longer true, a narrow interpretation, not followed by moderate Muslims. These uh, scholars from Saudi Arabia are saying that it has been abrogated, it's been cancelled, it does no longer apply because it doesn't, sit, doesn't fit in well with the ideology of segregation. Another footnote explicitly preaches segregation. This indicates that a Muslim should not stay in a non-Muslim country. Now, it's interesting. He's translating the Quran. Okay. The verse does not say anything about leaving Muslim, non-Muslim land. Here, they're trying to use the credibility of the Quran to push their own idea in selected areas. The underlying motive here is to find a way of com continuously implanting this permanent wedge between the wider British society and the younger Muslim living in Britain. He says King Abdullah's new translation has removed some objectionable material from previous Saudi versions. Made a bit of improvement, but it's not good enough. The Muslim World League told us some of the books we quoted from had been donated to them ten years ago, assessed, considered not suitable for distribution, and left in the basement. 
With regards to the translation of the Quran, it said, No translation is perfect, and not every interpretation is agreed. You have managed to find a few footnotes which you dislike, and which most readers probably do not even bother to read. It said any allegation that it is promoting a theology of intolerance, separatism and extremism was offensive and entirely untrue. The Royal Embassy of Saudi Arabia told us that the King Fahd Academy, the Muslim World League and the Islamic Cultural Center and Central Mosque were not part of the Saudi Arabian government or its instruments. It said, The Saudi Arabian government does not advocate or support the bigoted beliefs of extremists and there is no such organization as the Saudi Arabian religious establishment. It said Saudi Arabia promotes tolerance and mutual understanding and is at the forefront of international campaigns to stamp out and rehabilitate extremists. The British government says Saudi Arabia is its partner in tackling extremism, but critics say it's turned a blind eye to the importation of Wahhabism for years. Dennis McShane was a foreign office minister from 2002 to 2005 and became worried at the government's attitude to radical Saudi teaching. The British establishment, in my judgment, in the sense of Whitehall, senior ministers, refused to look at the penetration of Wahhabism into uh, schools, uh, into mosques. The ideology of what? Wahhabism promotes is deeply inimical and dangerous to the to British values but at the other level this was a huge source of revenue for British companies, British state, British people and that stopped I think any robust criticism of the Saudis. We were not firm enough in saying you should not export Wahhabism. He says the 7th of July bombings have been a wake-up call to ministers but the government still doesn't take a strong enough line with Saudi Arabia. Clearly, Britain is a big trading state with an important defence industry. It needs a relationship with Saudi Arabia. But we have to say quite clearly, you can't export anti-Jewish, anti-democratic, anti-Western, anti-rule of law, homophobic, anti-women ideology dressed up as a religion. That is not acceptable. The British government told us we have put in place robust legislation to combat incitement to religious hatred, violence and terrorism. All individuals and organisations based in the UK are subject to this legislation, regardless of the provenance of their funding or connections to third countries, Saudi or otherwise. The petrodollar money coming from Saudi Arabia has basically distorted the growth and development of Muslim community in Britain. That's what I accuse them of, the destruction of Islam itself, the abuse and misuse of this great faith of mine, and not only mine, but of my children as well. To think as I believe our government thinks, that it makes ideological sense to play patsy with the Saudis is folly of the first order of magnitude. We will be paying for it a vast amount in the years to come. It comes to pass that we find the Nasara, the Yahud, America, the UK, France, Germany, they have come against the religion of Al-Islam. Why give up your deed and your long legacy of Al-Islam to please someone who is enemy to you? Abu Usama is an American convert hey, my man. Where you from? and a very popular speaker at Green Lane. He preaches against